Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Radio Sessions Radio, everyone. This is Astrid on air. Call in 646-300-3700. A medicine like to be. And welcome, 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 welcome back to video. This is Astrid on Air, Thursday guest special. Today we have a really special guest indeed. Film producer Denise David Williams is with me to talk about the movie uh, for Dr. John Mack, who is a Harvard professor and uh, who was a Harvard professor. Unfortunately, he he got killed, and we'll talk about that too. But uh, for now, please visit www.johnmackmovie.com. John J O H N Mac M A C K Movie. Dot com, johnmacmovie.com, and help fundraise this fantastic film that we are going to discuss and develop all around Dr. John Mack and his research on abductions and abductees. Welcome to the show, uh, Denise. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Astrid. You're very welcome. So as a little introduction, I would like to say that it's coming up on the 10th anniversary of the death of Harvard psychiatry professor and Pulitzer Prize winning author, Dr. John Mag, who courageously defended alien abductees at the expense of his reputation, his family, and perhaps even his life. Dr. John Mack was a highly respected tenure Harvard professor, brilliant, skeptical, and mainstream, handsome and charismatic. <laughs> he counted the Rockefellers, <laughs> British aristocracy, and the Dalai Lama amongst his friends. His awards included the Nobel Peace Prize that he shared with an international association of doctors against nuclear arms, and a Pulitzer Prize for his psychoanalytical bi- biography of Lawrence of Arabia, which is a phenomenal story all right there. John believed in academia and in the practice of psychiatry as a pathway to understanding the world, but his adherence to these traditions did not protect him when he declared that people who claimed to have been abducted by aliens were not only telling the truth, but that what they'd learned from their experiences is crucial to the survival of humankind. By the end of his life, John Mack was regarded by some uh, some as visionary and modern-day Galileo, and by others as a fool who'd made an error of historic proportions. We're here to discuss with film producer Denise David Williams, who who has been granted the life rights by the Mack family to do a major motion picture about Dr. Mack. Now, Denise has a website, makemagicproductions.com and to where you'll find excerpts uh, very short and very interesting audio excerpts that uh, bring you in a little bit more into the story that we're going to develop here but the main reason for this uh, radio show today is because I am thrilled to promote, sponsor, talk about johnmacmovie.com. So please, if you have 10, 20, 150, or if you're really into these ETs and, 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 and real life stories about abductions and abductees, and you want this to be mainstream and you want people to know what's going on in the real world, please help fund johnmacmovie.com. Uh, and, and help Denise push along this production. Where are you at with the, with the production, Denise? Well, first I want to say, Astrid, that was just so beautifully put. <laughs> Thank you. That, that, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. You're very where we welcome. Are, where, where we are now is we – well, let me, let me take a few steps back in order to more fully answer your question. So I've been in the entertainment industry for – more than 25 years, and I know my way around it pretty well. And so after I was granted the rights for uh, John Mack's story, I went to many, many companies in Hollywood, and and there was a lot of interest. 
to to make the film. But what I found pretty much across the board was that uh, either they wanted me to just hand it over and say, you know, just give me the project and thank you very much and we'll take it from here, or it was a, a, a vision that I, we, my team, was really not comfortable with because to be entrusted with this story, which is so big and can really change the world, like you said, by bringing it mainstream and giving it legitimacy because of who Dr. Mack was, because of his credentials, uh, is, is really huge. And there's a responsibility there to tell the story without sensationalism, without exploiting him, without making him look silly. So what we've chosen to do just for the initial phase of the, of the production is to raise development funds through crowdsourcing because that way it will enable us to hire the writer that we know is the right writer and develop the script within in-house and, uh, and then go back and do it in a more traditional way, get the funding from a studio for the entire picture and, you know, and, and like I said, go the traditional route that a major motion picture would go. So that's why the support of John Mack's friends and colleagues and people who loved him around the world and people who are so interested and, and who are advocates of the phenomenon itself, we need your support in, in order to bring this really important story into the world. Mm -hmm. Now, were you personally... We just, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. We have a little time uh, because I, I'm guessing you're, you're – we have a little time lapse, technic technically speaking, so I apologize to our listeners if I seem to be cutting off uh, our guest. It's just technical uh, complications here in the back studios. But I wanted to know, Denise, were you personally interested in abductions and abductees, or were you personally – have you personally experienced an adoption? What, how come you got into this story? I, I'm going to answer that question is honestly, okay, instead of kind of sidestepping it. And really, ever since I was born, I feel like I've had a connection to, I've had a very strongly developed intuition, let's put it that way. And when you have that, and we all have the potential to have that, you really are open to a lot of experiences metaphysical experiences, non-physical experiences. I personally have not had an abduction experience, but I've had other non-physical experiences So my entire life. So to me, what Dr. Mack was saying, that there, you know, he just kept an open mind that there are other dimensions and other realities and that we really need to redefine our definition of reality so that it's broader than just this three-dimensional physical world, to me that resonated. To me that really was just, you know, like, of course, of course we do. So um, that's why when I heard when John Mack's story was told to me, I just, I literally got chills and went, wow, this is kind mm -hmm. of why I'm here on the planet, to bring my mm -hmm. work experience in Hollywood together with the telling of this very important story uh, and I felt like I could really be his champion. Right. And protect just, the story. Right. So I'm going to give a little background on uh, Dr. John Mack so that people understand that he was a very serious person. He, and this, I have to say, part of the extract that I'm reading is from Global Newspaper Company, so copyright uh, to them. Uh, he was a Cambridge resident. He founded the psychiatric department of Cambridge Hospital. He was, pra he was a certified as a practitioner of both child and adult psychoanalysis. His early research interests in psychology included dreams, nightmares, and teenage suicide. Now, that's going to be interesting to uh, comprehend how he approached the subject of abductees. John Edward Mack was born on October 4th, 1929 in New York. His parents were Edward Mack and Ruth. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree from Oberlin 
college in 1951 and his medical degree from Harvard in 55. He was also a graduate of the Boston Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. Uh, he entered at Massachusetts General Hospital and did his residency as, at the Massachusetts Med, Med, Mental Health Center. He served in the U.S. Air Force from 59 through 61, rising to captain, joining the Harvard Medical School for faculty in 64, Dr. Mack became professor of psychiatry in 72. In 83, he founded the Center for Psychology and Social Change, which, this, uh, which uh, recently became the Mack. He published about 150 scholarly ar articles. Among the 11 books he wrote or co collaborated on are Nightmares and Human Conflict in 1970 with Holly Hickler. He wrote Vivian, The Life and Suicide of an Ad Adolescent Girl in 81. In 1990, Dr. Mack began his research on people who say they have encountered extraterrestrials. In 94, with the publication of a best-selling book called Abductions. It was also that year Harvard Medical School appointed a special faculty co committee to review Dr. Mack's clinical care and clinical investigation of his subject. After a 15... Uh, what I was going to say is, if you'd like, we can tell your audience that the, the, the area that you're about to come up on, all that history is great because it really reinforces how credentialed he was. So if you want, we can I can pick it up from there and talk about where we see the arc of the film because this is exactly Absolute. the portion Absolute. of his life. I was just going to okay, finish so off on saying... Yeah. Uh, he, you know, he he got a 15-month process. The committee declined to take any action against him, but it was it was a rough time. So take it take it from there, Denise. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So as Astrid was just saying, John, well, here here's how John got into it, and it was very he, he was a, he was reluctant. This was not something that he went looking for. He was contacted by someone. He was an artist in New York, his name was Bud Hopkins, who had been kind of a de facto support person for alien abductees for several years. And he, he needed someone to help him and to kind of legitimize it. And so he went, he contacted John Mack, who was obviously a psychiatrist. And John was reluctant, but Bud Hopkins handed John a, a shoebox full of letters from people from all over the world who really needed help. And Bud said, John, in my opinion, these people are perfectly sane, but you're the psychiatrist, you decide. So John started to go through the, the box of letters, and he said to his wife, Sally, you know, people who think they've been abducted have got to be crazy. And he became curious what the underlying psychiatric syndrome might be, so he agreed to start studying them. But he didn't want to do it at his office at Harvard because he was embarrassed. So he set up a sort of a makeshift office in his son's bedroom in his home. And one by one, he had these perfectly normal-looking people come to his home. He went to great lengths to make sure they didn't meet each other so that they wouldn't be influenced. And he studied them one after another after another. He studied over 200 abductees. And he was really shocked with his conclusions. He had used his entire psychiatric arsenal on these people. And he said to his wife, these people are not crazy and these people are not lying. I know mental illness and this is not mental illness. And so he decided to become a champion of them. He, he traveled the world. He met with African shaman and Australian aborigines who all were telling almost identical abduction stories to the people he had studied at home. He said at one point, when an African bushman and an upscale New England housewife are telling the exact same story, we have to take the conversation seriously. So mm -hmm. he put his findings in his best-selling book, Abduction, and went on a media tour. And when Harvard saw him on national television saying that aliens were real, they were <laughs> mortified. They are like, oh, my God. You know, they were just so embarrassed. So as Astrid was saying, they convened a secret committee to try to discredit him, to take away his tenure, to ruin his reputation. And for 14 months, Dr. Mack endured really a witch hunt. And um, 
But in spite of it, he continued to champion the abductees. He said there's an authentic mystery here, there's something truthful, there's something valuable about this phenomenon, and we need to keep an open mind. So that's why so many people say that he really was a modern-day Galileo because he didn't go looking for this, but when he stumbled upon it, he had a tremendous courage to risk losing his family, which he kind of did. His wife divorced him, and his reputation at Harvard, his colleagues literally thought he had lost his mind and that he was committing professional suicide. And yet he couldn't turn away from what he had discovered. And so he is his story is the perfect hero's journey. It's an incredible protagonist for a film. And, um, you know, we're just really so excited and so honored to be able to, to shepherd it into the world. Right. Uh, he he at one and you have fantastic excerpts on your on your uh on your website. Once again, the website is www.makemagicproductions.com. You've got little audio clips where the wife uh says that she too is a therapist and she she was used to, you know, people hiding under the <laughs> hiding under the sofa or going running into the closet or things like that. But she seems to say that what she heard behind the walls was quite extreme. And here I want to give a little bit of my own experience as a clinical hypnotherapist, having done past life uh, regressions and things like that. I have come across clients who describe uh, abductions and being, you know, abductees. And as the hypnotherapist yourself, you, 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 there, you know, there's a part of your brain that says, is this for real? Is this true? You know, yeah. how, um, how elaborate was his uh, screening for these people? Well, that's a great question. It really does go to the heart of it. He used everything that he had as a psychiatrist. And at a very interesting, uh, there was a very interesting study. Harvard was part of part of the committee's um, criticism was that John didn't really uh, solicit the help of other Harvard colleagues. So he went to the psychology department and agreed, brought some abductees with him who agreed to submit themselves to a series of a battery of tests. And what they did was they hooked up the person with electrodes in a booth, and they read them a happy story, a scary story, a neutral story, and then read them one of their own abduction stories. And what they found was that their physiological responses tested off the charts, more than Vietnam vets, more than rape victims. And the one thing that the psychiatric community agrees upon is that you cannot fake physiological responses to trauma. So Mm -hmm. the data was actually there, but his colleagues in the psychology department just refused to acknowledge that there was the possibility that aliens existed, so they just said, well, we're going to interpret the data differently. And so John could have been vindicated in that way to a degree. His colleagues wouldn't do it. So that's one of the ways that John did vigorous testing. and also he was trained in a Freudian method, so he his method was interviewing and talking. And, um, you know, that was another way. I, I know he also used hypnosis, which was controversial, but, um, you know, those those were his methods. He, uh, he also says, uh, uh, actually I got a, uh, an excerpt from a PBS interview, Nova, uh, where he says, I'm trying to find the exact words. Uh, he says that basically, people, yes, they, you know, they go through hypnosis and and things like that, and they share their experiences. But in fact, it's it's a lot of times these abductions were done when they were, uh, you know, going around with their daily lives, aware, awake, eyes open, and all of a sudden there's this process that happens which is kind of the basic storyline for every abduction and they find themselves uh, partly paralyzed and then 
kind of lifted off. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. Mm-hmm. It's it's a pretty involuntary, not pretty, it's an involuntary experience that can be quite terrifying and mm-hmm. quite traumatic. But the thing that, that really separated John and the thing that's so interesting <clears throat> to me is that John took it further than other researchers in that he said that it's it it it, it looks like a shamanic journey the shamanic uh, test where the student is pushed off a cliff and mm-hmm. is terrified but then faces his fears and then is transformed spiritually transformed as a result of going through the the trauma and John drew a parallel between alien abduction and and that that experience of being thrown off a cliff that so many of his patients once they got beyond it were transformed and they mm-hmm. changed you know they felt a deep kinship to the planet a deep connection to our fellow man and um they felt uh motivated to be of service in some way so that's pretty profound when you think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, when you get past the scary, you know, they're here to whatever, fill in the blank. So that's that's the aspect of John's work that to me is so fascinating and is so valuable that there's something more to it. Right. The spiritual experience is is really something that he found fascinating as well as the fact that um, they, he says, he talks about abductees recognizing that um, the, the abductees recognize also themselves as alien participants to the abduction process. Now, the, um, and what I'm referring to is where Dr. John Mack says, okay, these guys, they're humans, they know they're humans, they're, they understand they're being abducted, they understand they're victim of, you know, uh, uh, physical, physical, I would call it abuse personally, but <laughs> um, apparently aliens don't think that way, and at least not the ones that abduct, and um, and that there's this, this process, this, this moment where they understand that not only are they the humans that are being the victim, but also th- somehow they become also the alien participant in the abduction of the human form that the spirit, this is my understanding, that the spirit inhabits as the abductee. What would you understand that to be, Denise? Well, to your first point about um, the aliens abusing humans, so this is what Dr. Max said about that. I think I think this is like an incredible analogy. We take a baby to the doctor to get vaccinated, and the doctor sticks a needle in the baby, and and the baby cries and screams, and from the baby's level of consciousness, it's horrible, right? It's, right, it's horrible. Right. Right. But from the parents and the doctor's broader perspective, it's for the baby's well-being, there's value to it, you know, on and on and on. So when we when we shift our our perspective and consider that, mm-hmm. it's you know, it shines a different light on it. So um uh that's that's how he saw it. And that's a very unusual perspective. He was one of the few to see it that way. Mm-hmm. In terms of inhabiting, uh, inhabiting, I can't really speak to that because I I don't know. You don't know. Uh, let me see if I can find the passage. Um, I'm afraid I I can't find it right now. I'll read you this part though. Uh, the, referring again to what we previously said, Dr. Max says, the person may be in their bedroom quite wide awake. The beings show up, and there they are, and the experience begins, that they're not occurring in any dreamlike state. Now, sometimes they do occur when a person is dozing off or in a hypnotic, hypnogic, jeez, I never thought that word existed, 
uh, in the mm-hmm. hypno, hypnotic uh, state, but very frequently not. So, so the simple answer would be yes, it's both. It's both literally, physically happening to a degree, and it's also some kind of psychological, spiritual experience occurring and originating perhaps in another dimension. Did That's he... Right. Did uh, uh, I, I can I can only imagine what your your movie is going to be about because now we're touching different dimensions. What did you say to that? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean it's 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 deep and it's provocative. John did say that you know originally when he was studying the phenomenon, he said it was strict. He believed it was a strictly physical thing, like you just read. You know, they they come in do whatever they're going to do with you, and it's here. It's actually happening in our physical world. But after a few years, John came to believe it was more of a crossover experience, meaning they crossed over from another dimension, and whatever the experience or interaction was, is what happened, and and then they crossed back. So they were manifesting here. That's another. That's the reason why John said, they couldn't leave physical evidence. Perhaps evidence on the on someone's physical body, but not literally, you know, items or objects. Um, that it was impossible if it happened that way from another dimension. So these are, you know, these are very deep things to contemplate. But when you mm-hmm. think about it, Astrid, we, in especially in Western culture are very locked into a paradigm of thinking that says, if I can't touch it, if I can't see it, then it doesn't exist. Right. And we're one of the few cultures in the world that believes that way. You know, other cultures don't really have a problem saying, sure, there's something greater. Sure, my intuition is very important, um, which is what John, you know, John went from being an atheist with a very materialistic worldview and after doing this work, he became, in his own words, intuitive, heart-based, and a very spiritual man. So in our opinion, our filmmakers, it's, if the film can convey his story that way, then think about the hearts and minds that it can touch of people all over the planet. To just contemplate, to just contemplate allowing that other element of life to be as real and as valuable as the physical. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of us are in the closet with our experiences, with our stories. It's not quite yet, you know, 20 years ago, the world definitely was not ready. But we believe the world is ready now, and that's why this film is coming out, why, why you know, why it's being born and and why so many people are rallying around saying, yes, it's time. It's really time for the conversation to come out of the closet. Right, and that's a really good point, the conversation, because there are so many out there in, in, in the fields of spirituality and the paranormal uh, fields that cl- still clash today. You know, one... Uh, some people are more fear-based and other people are more love-based, I would put it, and more comprehensive of a greater picture and a greater alliance and a greater meaning for for the reason of humanity and the reason of these abductions, etc. Um, did John Max ever, you know, state exactly what he thought the reason of these abductions were from the alien perspective? Well, he kind of did. Again, if you if if the listeners go to johnmacmovie.com, there are some clips of John talking at the end of the video, and and he addresses that very question, Astrid. He he, an interviewer asked him, "Well, John, what what why is this happening?" And he says, "Well, I don't know. I don't know. You know, maybe it's to expand our consciousness. Maybe it's because we're destroying our planet, and they're trying to get our attention. Maybe it's because we're headed in." as you said, a fear-based direction, and, and that's not good for the evolution of our species. He speculated on a lot of things, but he was humble enough to say, I don't know. I only mm-hmm. know what the 
experiencers, which he preferred to call them because he felt the mm-hmm. word abductee was more of a, a victim word, and the abductees themselves preferred the word experience, sir. So, mm-hmm. you know, he speculated, and but then he also said, I can't say for certain. Is there any commonality between the 200-plus studies that he did uh, in terms of maybe location, style of life, um, age, that could tell us why this person and not the neighbor? That I mean, God, that's a great question. And the answer is, no, nothing. I mean, from a child, I, I don't know if you're aware of the Zimbabwe aerial school sighting in Zimbabwe in mm-hmm. 1995, uh, 62 uh, South African school children had a sighting, that, and John interviewed them. They were incredibly credible. Oh, he did. And he did, yeah. We have a clip of that on our website as well. These children are they're like eight years old and they are just so sincere and so authentic. It just blows you away when you hear Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, you have those children and then you have uh, people in all kinds of professions, all ages, Uh, you know, people, yeah, there was no commonality, commonality in who this was, happening to and as John used to say this is not a club that anybody would want to belong to because it was to many people embarrassing terrifying they couldn't talk about it because they'd be ridiculed so um, you know it it wasn't you know it wasn't something that you wanted to happen to you well, okay, so I've had uh, uh, certain times when, and, and I have to disclose the fact that, yes, I am a psychic medium channeler, so for certain people, I might be woo-woo out there, whatever. Uh, I do live in California, you know, and all that stuff, uh, but I am French, so maybe that makes me more crazy, God knows, but I did have, you know, a couple of of moments where I felt that... Um, First of all, I go into into spaceships. I, I kind of enjoy. There's this woman, that friend of mine, and um, sometimes I go visit her, and I I kind of spy into conversations that they have on the ships. And sometimes it's not funny at all. It's kind of terrifying just to watch. And then once I felt myself uh, lobotomized, and then another time I felt myself, like you said, paralyzed. Uh, from the waist down in my bed, I was fully awake, and I felt like they were stripping my skin off my bones. Mm. And wow. but when but when you have these experiences, you know, and you're so mental like I am, and it, you know that there are different states of consciousnesses, there are different levels of experiencing your thoughts and your programmed you know, whatever you have in your computerized mind. So it's very difficult, even for the person who experiences such things, to come to terms with its reality. And sure. so, you know, and um, I, can, I can only imagine how difficult it is for someone to step forward and say, look, I've had these experiences, I really believe they are, because each experience of every person is an, is reality. That's the way I see it. You experience something, exactly. it's part of your reality. It might not be part of someone who's watching you and saying, I don't see what you see, or I'm not feeling what you're feeling, you know, but in that, in that like Akashic record kind of thing, it's your it's your data, it's your experience in the moment. Um, and then coming out and seeing that other people have, have had such experiences with identical processes is the, is the, is the key word here. They're all having yeah. the same, it's like uh, near-death experiences. They all go through the same process, you know, and then they come back. Um, there must be something to it, so... How are you going to approach this in your film? Is this going to be more of a documentary biography style film? Or are you going to uh, perhaps have the act or personify Dr. Max's experience throughout with the people flipping out in front of him and the physical 
you know, the, 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 the physical coming out of the skin type. I don't know. What, what mm-hmm. physicality mm-hmm. is um, connected? Do, have you seen photos or videos of, re, of ab- abduction results? Um, to go to your first question about how the film, you know, what kind of film it's going to be and how we're going to, what the story arc will be. This is a theatrical film. It's not a documentary, meaning it's a film, you buy a ticket, you go to the theater, you get your popcorn, and you have an incredible, entertaining experience. Having said that, (laughs) we we know that there's more to it and that it's an opportunity. Think about Close Encounters. That was an incredible film. It touched people all over the world. It was extremely entertaining, but it was also extremely provocative. And in that sense, that's what John Mack, you know, that that's what we're aiming for. That's it's the a movie. mainstream film. Yes. Awesome. That's how awesome. we see it. And, and including the kids in it, I mean, that's just going to, you know, trigger so many emotions and, and reactions, I bet. Um, exactly. The, I mean, it's a very emotional story. Very. You know, it's cerebral, but it's also very emotional and gut-wrenching, mm-hmm. which is great for a film. You want to take your audience on an emotional ride. Mm-hmm. Is, is uh, Mrs. Mack still around? I'm guessing yes. Mrs. Mack is around. She is. She's, um, yeah, she is. Let me just leave it at that. She is. She is. She's a very nice lady. Very, very nice lady. Uh, She must have gone through a rough time herself with all these uh, issues with Harvard. And would you like to talk a little bit about uh, the Harvard side of the story? Sure. Um, So, you know, Harvard is obviously a very esteemed institution. Uh, That can't be disputed. Uh, but when John started doing this work, their their paradigm, which is very, really very uh, entrenched, you know, it was was threatened. And Alan Dershowitz, I we have it on our website, uh, had a came to John's defense because of just basically on the subject of academic freedom. And he said, uh, isn't it interesting at a place of esteemed higher learning such as Harvard that angels are okay, aliens not okay? So, you know, you could be in the theology department at Harvard. You could study angels. You can get a degree in angels and religion. That's okay. But when it came to aliens, quote, unquote, Harvard, you know, that they drew the line there. Mm. And so that's why they form that secret committee and put John to that to the witch hunt that they put him through. Did and they that ever say was part of the film? Did they ever say why? I mean, um a friend of mine reminded me this morning that and you know, I haven't done my research on it, but the skull and bone group are uh are part of Harvard, and would I, I don't know how that would be linked with them not wanting anyone to speak about extraterrestrials, but it just shows that these groups uh, of very specific beliefs and practices do exist. Uh, the divine, I think the divine, uh, what is it called? Divine Institute is part of Harvard too. These these groups that, like you said, talk about angels freely and talk and talk about, I, I'm guessing, skull and bones freely. You know, uh, they refuse to to accept that in research because that's the key word. It was all about doing research on something that may or may not exist, and for someone, you know, as uh, as as experienced as as Dr. Mack in psychiatry, you'd think that Harvard would say, hey, you're the perfect guy to figure this out and tell us if it's right or if it's true or not. So, you would think so, but that's not how it came down. It didn't come down like that. No, no. But, you know, Astrid, I really think things, some things happen for a reason. And look how 
powerful John Mack's life is and that, you know, just the whole series of events, how it's allowing us now to pick up the torch, reignite the conversation, and go forward and tell his story, and, you know, 20 years later, where people truly are more open to it. And, you know, and we can bring it to the mainstream. Mm -hmm. So it all, all the pieces fit kind of perfectly when you think about it. Now, um, there's another thing in relationship to Harvard University. Um, as I under, and I may have this, but I, I thought that Dr. John Mack's work had already been undergoing for four years before the Harvard University uh, wanted to investigate his work. Is that correct or is that a misunderstanding? That is, that is correct. That is correct. He started in 1990, and as I said, he he was way under the radar. He was he kept it confined mm. to his home. He had he had the confidence of a few select colleagues, um, and uh, it wasn't until 1994 when his findings came out in his best-selling book, Abduction, that he went you know he went wide. He was on right. Oprah, Larry King. He was on every major media show you can imagine and that's when you know he when harvard heard about it and the whole it hit the mm-hmm. fan so to speak mhm mhm um and then there's also his death kind of weird too he got run over by a speeding car in london before before a presentation would there would there have been anything in his presentation that some people would rather the information not be told publicly? Well, you know, he was speaking on the anniversary of his Pulitzer, so that had nothing to do with his abduction work. And the family officially uh, agreed that he was killed by a drunk driver and that, you know, he was in London, he was an American, so, you know, it's easy for an American to look the wrong way when crossing the street in London. So that's... (laughs) <laughs> so that's our position. You know, we're I know there are all kinds of theories and stuff, but that's we're, that we're not going there. Yeah, you're leaving it at that, right? Um Yeah. Now, Dr. John Mack talks about uh, extraterrestrials trying to connect with us and he calls us unconscious humans. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, his quote was, this is an outreach call to the spiritually impaired, <laughs> which I ah. think he was kind of tongue-in-cheek, but, but think about it. I mean, turn on the news, turn on the regular mainstream radio, and just, you know, look at our world and our, our planet and the consciousness that exists and to a great degree prevails. And so what John was saying was, hey, can we maybe, like, start thinking a bit outside of the box? You know, maybe there's a broader paradigm for us here in this universe. I mean, to me, that's not really outrageous. To me, it's outrageous not to consider that we're not alone in the universe and that the possibilities of something broader than our little physical world are very great. So, you know, that's why John Mack was such a hero to so many of us. Mm. He says uh, they may have been wanting through through whatever they were doing to make a greater connection with us. And at one point he refers to, like we said earlier, you know, how human humanity is destroying itself and that uh, abductees or, or participants, if you will, in abductions um, reported that this may go into the time where the East and the West Coast kind of crumble. Spiritual as I am, I kind of have a tendency to connect that with uh, the Edgar Cayce prophecies and the Nostradamus prophecies. Uh, Was he in any way interested in either uh, either people? 
Uh, Edgar Casey and and who was the other one? No, Nostradamus. Nostradamus. Oh, oh yeah. Um, you know, I don't. I really can't say. <clears throat> I, mm-hmm. I'm I'm not sure about that. Hmm. Mm. What were his hobbies outside of uh, those? <laughs> <laughs> outside of aliens. <laughs> Uh, yeah. well, he was extremely, extremely well read, and he was uh, he loved nature, and um, he was he was interested in so many different things. And he had a great intellect, a huge heart, and <clears throat> and um, many, many, many friends all over the world who invited him to participate in all kinds of activities. So he he you know he was really multifaceted. And um, it's interesting that he's going to, you know, be best known for his work with abductees. But as you re- said earlier in the program, he really did so many more things than his work with abductees. Yes, I was wondering. I was asking the question because perhaps he did meditation. He was interested in um, uh, telepathy, um Mind control, I mean, all these uh, uh, connections through the mind to other realities and other souls in other dimensions, like we mentioned earlier. Because he was at earlier, I mentioned something about him being um, very proficient in dreams and uh, youth yes. suicides. Yes. So, and also, he, he and later in his life, when he had kind of moved on from the abduction work, he became very interested in continued consciousness. And he was working with a, a physicist whose daughter had passed, and they were. He was very interested in what happens after the physical body, you know, after we drop the physical body. So. Right. Uh, you know, but unfortunately, he didn't get much time to spend on that before he passed over himself. Right. I'm thinking back to Albert Einstein, who was interested in astronomy and in, in um, you know, vision, uh, informational data that comes to you through the vision and the mind. And um, I kind of had a flash of him being curious about it, but perhaps not doing it himself. Do you know what he when he went to the Aborigines in Australia or um or the shamans do you know if he actually participated in mind empowering practices of any sort Well he did he he uh he he practiced holotropic breathwork Are you familiar with that the Stanislav no. Grof method that is kind of how John got into the whole thing. And, um, you know, it's interesting because John always was sort of, I, what's the word, dismayed that he himself wasn't having or didn't have an experience. He really wanted to, but obviously you can't, you can't make that happen <laughs> because it never happened to him. So, mm. um, but, but he did want to experience it. Mm. How about yourself, Denise? After making laughs you know, or thinking about this movie, would you have you tried out certain practices that may get you into a greater communication with extraterrestrial? Because we know they're out there. I mean, we see them in the sky every day now. <laughs> um, have you tried having a greater experience for yourself to get more in tune maybe with what the subjects of your film are, are going to kind of portray? Uh, sure, uh, but I actually haven't had to try. I've actually been able to have... See, now this is exactly the per- <laughs> this is exactly the purpose of this whole project because my hesitation is, okay, I'm going to be laughed off the air. Do you know what I mean? This is exactly what we're trying to break through. Um, and that's why you're on Brilliant I'll- Essence because here everybody is with you. Everybody has phenomenal experiences and they're real and they're true and they're true to us and they're true to many around us. So 
feel safe. We are your listeners and your viewers. <laughs> so bring it on, Denise. Bring it okay, on. Okay. <laughs> so, so really from really from the minute I was born, literally, I remember I have the conscious memory of looking up and seeing my parents leaning over the crib, and the conscious memory was, oh, okay, here we go, meaning, you know, the veil had not dropped yet, and I knew I was here in a body and I had to go through this incarnation and experience whatever that karmic contract was that I had agreed to. So that was from literally hour one. Then throughout my life I've had, I described it as very highly developed intuition, but it's really a lot more than that. I've, I've you know, channeled dead people and, and not because I've tried to, just because they show up on my shoulder. <laughs> wanting me to convey a message to someone or, you know, or something. Uh, so many of those experiences. So many, it's come very naturally to me. I, I also have incredible guidance from beings of the Christ light who I spent several years with in the 90s. It was myself and a group of us who basically who gathered because of the call of our hearts, and they transmitted to us really what's happening now. They told us what would be happening, what our individual mandates would be, and oh, wow. this film was my mandate to bring it forth into the world and to protect it and make sure it was done with integrity. And so I do have ongoing guidance from beautiful, very, very highly evolved beings. I can't say if they're, quote-unquote, extraterrestrials, but I've been told that they kind of speak as one, and that's good enough for me. Right. You know, I'll share you a little um, a little story. I was in Sequoia Park, and I was doing a personal meditation with the Buddha, and um, there appeared when Buddha descended. There appeared all the levels of the souls. The 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 it was i don't know if i can describe it well enough but all the levels of the plants and the animal kingdoms and the mm -hmm. the the souls uh experiences and the angel i mean it was absolutely and in the process they were the uh, extraterrestrial levels and there I was brought, again, I connected with my friend, and she brought me, I said, you know, we've talked, and but I'm more into, I don't care about what happens in spaceships and what you do with humans and stuff like that. I want to understand your spirituality. Mm. And she brought, she brought me to this to this um, space, inside the spaceship, and there was this, Huge, huge. I mean, the the, the it, it was like a fifteen feet ceilings kind of thing, and there was this huge energetic moving form uh, in front of me, and um, this form transmuted, like shape shifted, into all these goddesses and gods and de you know animal uh, uh, features and. And I said, oh, so you're idolizing something. And she said, listen, look. And the form showed me how it was, in fact, trans, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, like a, like a, tra it was like a transformer of knowledge and uh -huh. information that came through uh -huh. this form. And it called itself the all knowing, the wow. all knowing, and it wow. was it was very mental because I understood that these guys were just looking and understanding that everything was formation, processable information, processable information, transformative, co-creative, processing mm. information. And I was I was just blown away. I was just blown away by wow. that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. I think there's a level of consciousness where you understand that everything co-created can be computerized and 
put down in ones and zeros because it has to align, it has to connect or disconnect, associate, transmute, etc. That's just the creative essence but there's intelligence behind it and that intelligence we're all part of and we can be conscious co-creators in that intelligence yes. to produce and manifest the reality that we desire, right? Exactly, exactly. Right. I, went, I went a bit out there. <laughs> I haven't been... <laughs> Oh, well, Denise, uh, I want to tell everybody again, please go and uh, support this film, www.johnmacmovie.com, johnmacmovie.com, to come out soon. We want all the help possible to get this out to the mainstream so that people do understand that not only are we not alone, we are connecting, communicating, and co-creating. Um, there might be a bigger meaning to these abduction processes and the sense of why they bring back physical testimonies of their abductions. And I can't wait to see it, Denise. I really can't. We have to stay in touch. Okay. And uh, Yes, absolutely. Is there anything you'd like to add before we go? Just that I want to thank you for having me, Astrid, and for this really provocative informative conversation that's so valuable to the planet. Thank you, you know, for part Thank for you. participating and doing your part. You're amazing, Denise. I, I, I did a little uh mini T V series in the Santa Cruz area before two thousand and twelve wanting to tell people, you know, ETs do exist. They are out there and uh interviewing people who even had no clue like um a major, uh, a U.S. Army major, uh, Korean. And I said, you know, there, there are testimonies out there that are coming out with the military that tell of uh, UFOs and the presence of extraterrestrials. And she had absolutely no clue. No clue. Or perhaps she didn't want to tell me. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's why a mainstream, that's why John Mack's story as a mainstream film can just provoke a conversation, you know, a sincere conversation. Uh, it's powerful. And it's, you know, movies are very effective ways of communication. So uh, that's why this film is so really very, very valuable. And all of us can help birth it, literally give it birth. Give it birth, give it meaning, and give it attention. JohnMacMovie.com, exactly. guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure having you on air, Denise. Come back anytime. And we're Thank going you. to leave it with Jimmy G starting over. I don't know why you're on.
Blog Talk Radio.